need or craving to be of service to, to fellow human beings, be able to adapt to different scenarios. The way we deliver chiropractic education needs to evolve. The, the solution to this problem is more schools. Today, I'm here with Vasilios Golfanopoulos, uh, the president of the European Chiropractors Union. So welcome, Vaz, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Matthew. The honor is mine. So Vaz, what do you think makes a good chiropractor? Well, very good question. Um, I, I don't think we can pin it down to one thing. I think we have to go for a mosaic of different qualities. Uh, without saying one needs to be good on all the relevant uh, com competencies that we get taught at school. So good diagnostician, a good adjuster, somebody with uh, good uh, people skills. Uh, but then I think it's essential that one, especially for chiropractic and healthcare profession, has this um, innate, if you like, need or craving to be of service to, to fellow human beings. Uh, I think that's very important to, to have a fulfilling as well as successful career as chiropractor. And if forced to pin it down to one quality, which I think is important for all healthcare professions and all professions, to be honest, I think it would be to be adaptive or adaptable be able to adapt to different scenarios, to, to be adaptable in a, in a long 30, 40 year careers, to, to adapt in different scenarios in, in one day at clinic or at work. So I think uh, all the, the, the previews, but uh, I would highlight mostly the adaptability. And do you think the, the, uh, our colleagues have that uh, sense of, of service to the right degree? Well, I think uh, part of the uh, praise we keep hearing as a profession from like the feedback from our patients and, and society and, and a great part of the success we enjoy is exactly that, is that uh, chiropractors do care about their, their patients, do care about other people. And, and uh, we, we don't do what we do as part of a system that just mills people through. So yes, I believe we are very good at what we do and it is something we can, we can uh, teach to other, other uh, allied professions, if you like. And what do you think the future holds for chiropractic education in Europe? Oh. Uh, I think a few years ago, we tackled that question with uh, a session at the European Chiropractors Union uh, Convention in, in Limassol, in Cyprus. And it was uh, Professor Heimut Thiel and Dr. Jerry Klum and Professor Bruce Walker. And I had the honor of, of, of chairing that, that session. I think that their verdict was pretty much unanimous. And the verdict was that uh, the way we deliver chiropractic education needs to evolve and adapt. And when I say that, uh, we mean um, conversion courses, part-time courses, courses based on placement schemes, as we see now at South Bank Uni in London and Teesside. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that we have to move away from the outdated, uh, if not obsolete system of contact hours, etc. And we look into competencies now. Uh, uh, that is more of an educator. Uh, answer, so I'm not going to expand on that, but it's definitely competencies nowadays. Uh, and if we add to all of that the, the inevitable embracement of technology in the delivery that the pandemic helped us uh, deal with easier, and, and of course the, the, the embracement of technology in the treatment, uh, put in there some uh, uh, widening of the access and uh, some acceleration of the growth, and I think uh, that's the picture of the chiropractic education in a few years' time. And how do you see the ECU um, facilitating that? Well, um, the ECU, as you said, um, has been around uh, since 1932. Uh, the needs of the profession regarding education um, have been very different from decade to decade, um, from era to era. Uh, 
just before lockdown, I, I went through our archives and uh, I was in London and found some very interesting minutes of uh, meetings that document the discussion and planning that went on during those meetings in the 60s, just prior to the founding of AACC, first ever uh, school of chiropractic in, in, uh, in Europe, um, including other than the discussion, some general financial assistance, of course, but then it, it, it was similar in the 80s for IFEC in France, or DENS in the 90s, Denmark. So all these are educational milestones of the profession in Europe of the time. The ECU was there, present, if not instrumental. And as time goes by, we, the focus is shifting. So now we, the ECU, what we do a lot is we have the academy and we are involved in continuous professional development, CPD, graduate education programs. And of course, nowadays, Gen C, which is the online, an online, a very successful online effort for CPD. So um, then on top of that, we have ECCE, which we are a very loyal and strong supporter, providing high educational standards. So we've been doing a number of things. So again, if I have to highlight one, uh, and the one I'm most particularly proud of, and I was particularly proud of it, even before I became, I was president or treasurer back in the days when I was a simple member of the ECU, is that the ECU has always been and will always be a safe space, as I like to call it, a forum where ideas can fight it out for influence, you know, where complacency can be challenged, where we don't, uh, we question the, oh, this is how it's always been done, we cannot change it, no, all of that, of course, within uh, the perimeters of the current evidence and ethic boundaries that the ECU stands for, but allowing for, for um, a mixture of things to happen until we come up with what's right to go forward with. Chiropractic is essentially a white middle class profession, largely. How can we improve the diversity, both ethnically and demographically, in the profession? Uh, we have achieved a relatively valid profession when it comes to gender. I think we all know that. But yes, uh, diversity of ethnicity, culture, class, we're still lacking at. Uh, so yes, how, how and, and not only in students, but in faculty as well. Uh, keeping in mind that faculty is reflective of the students most of the times. So um, I believe the, the answer to that, the, the, the solution to this problem is more schools, but not just more schools, a more widespread schools in more countries, uh, not, not again and again in the same countries that we already have schools. And if we are gonna have schools in countries already uh, with education in different cities, in different areas, uh, uh, of, of, of the country, and if possible, schools within public universities where there's a wider access uh, to the public, and, and within health schools if possible. So I think that, that will allow us to reach a wider percentage of the demographic. And let's not underestimate, it will take us back to, to the earlier discussion, the earlier question, about the diversity of provision and delivery. Now, if we, if we are bold enough to, to do all this uh, innovative delivery, that will greatly assist the diversity of students as well, because it will open up the access to more, uh, to a greater percentage of the demographic. So by, we can kill two birds with one stone there. So where do you think the profession will be globally in a decade or so? Uh, I think it is imperative. We understand as a profession that the future will look like what we are willing to invest in. Our collective choices and decisions are what will formulate uh, one version of the future or another. Now, my hope and of course, my intention as I'm part of the leadership in Europe is to have a distinctive European voice, a voice that will be based uh, 
on scientific evidence, on the current scientific evidence, uh, a voice that would be integrated into the national healthcare systems, and through that will solve the problem accessibility because we need to be widely accessible, something we're not right now. Uh, we need to be up close there with the other healthcare professions. Uh, we need to be visible in our communities. And in order to be visible in our communities, uh, we need to be relevant to the needs of our communities. Uh, we need to stop pushing what we want the patients to do and, and, and listen what the patients need and provide that. And of course, we need to be affordable to all levels of society. So uh, allow me, as a Greek, I think I'm allowed one ancient Greek proverb per interview, Matthew. So uh, uh, there is one that says that a society grows great when old citizens plant trees in whose shade they know they will never sit. So if we paraphrase that, and by society, we mean our profession, and by old citizens, we mean individuals, institutions, nations, associations that have high and important achievements for healthcare. Then we see that a vital ingredient to achieve this dream and vision for all of our profession is no other than solidarity and international collaboration. So research has attracted the lion's share of funding in the profession over the last few decades. Do you think education and training gets a fair crack of the whip regarding uh, uh, funding? Well, I can see why you say that, Matthew. And it's true that if we look at the uh, absolute numbers, uh, what we describe is right. Uh, still, as we are a relatively undeveloped profession, uh, we need to make choices. And uh, you're right, perhaps, at the moment that there is a, little, a more, more funds uh, channeled towards uh, research rather than education. Uh, the reason behind it being that, of course, there is a link between education and research. They are, they are uh, uh, linked to one another, and, and, and it's usually it's the educationalists that participate in research and, and vice versa. So uh, I do think, yes, that the profession needs to step up and look into uh, education more seriously, because it's the element of growth uh, while retaining the quality of education we have. So yes, I will agree with you, and I think we need to look into it and do something about it. Well, there are always lots of priorities, uh, competing priorities very often uh, for, uh, for those in your position. Um, so as, as we draw to a close, are there any other uh, issues that uh, you want to raise? Well, I would like to raise an issue that um, it's widely known as the illusion of isolation. Um, I think it's very important to understand how harmful and how dangerous for the profession is to have the illusion of isolation. And I mean it in a lot of different levels. Uh, when we isolate as a profession from the rest of the healthcare provision and system, or when some of us, some pockets of the profession, isolate for the re rest of the profession. Uh, such a strategy, such a policy could even in the, have some benefits in the short term, uh, but it's inevitably and always damaging in the long term. As I said, uh, we are doing great compared with 10, 20 years ago, but when compared with some of our comp competitors, we have a very long way to go, only to catch up with them in terms of development, in terms of acceptance, in terms of integration into the healthcare system, in terms of interaction with the decision-making centers. There is a long list of, of areas that as a profession we can and we should and we will improve. So, as I said earlier, the key word and one that the ECU has and will keep standing for is solidarity. 
uh, the, the, uh, the motto goes, together we can move mountains. Well, I would like to let the profession know that together we have moved mountains. Our 88 year history at the ECU is full of moments where we did move mountains and we made great development for that time. We might be looking back now and thinking, well, that was not that great. If you go 40, 50, 60 years back, those things were mega. So we need to stick together. We need to be together, uh, help each other in the need, in the moment of need uh, and have stamina because victory goes to the last person standing. So we need to have stamina, we need to have vision ahead and understand that we are as strong as our weakest link and that there has never been a better time for us, there has never been a better time to be a chiropractor and if we invest generously and wisely, the profession will reap the fruits of this effort very, very soon. And before we close, uh, you did some lecturing yourself in the past, didn't you? Can we tempt you back to academia? Oh, dear me. Yes, you're right. Well, um, I think it was back in... Uh, I graduated in 99 and I went straight in, in uh, what we call today Wilk, uh, University of Glamorgan back in those days. Uh, and I think I did the, the best of two, two and a half years of, uh, of lecturing uh so well yes i always miss it and after i concluded with it and i came back to greece to practice i knew that it would be a part of me that will always be unsatisfied because i loved i loved that exchange between you know teacher and student and uh, i loved my my uh, chiropractor and patient uh, uh, exchange and I know that they're both very important to me. So yes, I've been missing it for the past 20 almost years. I would love to, to go back to academia. I don't know how relevant it will be nowadays. I will have to go to do a fair, a fair degree of, of uh, studying and revision, but it would be uh, wonderful, yes. <laughs> That's Golfinopoulos. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Matthew. It was a great pleasure.